Welcome to the 2022 ICRA conference, Culture and Security, International Cultural Relations as an Enabler of Peace Through Engagement. We're delighted to have you with us for the session, which is the fourth of five online sessions through which we're exploring the contribution of arts, culture, education, and civil society to peace and security. And thinking in particular about the role that international cultural relations programs can play in that. We we're also delighted that our conference was selected to be an official side event of the UNESCO Mondial 2022 World Conference on Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development, which gets underway in Mexico City tomorrow from the 28th to the 30th of September. I'm Avril Joffe from the Cultural Policy and Management Department, uh, University of the Vatvatistrand in the School of Arts, South Africa. I'm a UNESCO expert for the 2005 Convention on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, and I'll be moderating the session today. Before I introduce our panelists of the session, which we have called What Works, a look at case studies of international cultural relations programs and projects centered on peace and security, I just wanted to say a few words to frame how the session fits into the overall program of the conference and its wider aims and objectives, and to highlight some of the key themes that we might be able to pick up in our discussion later on. Before I do that, just a bit more background and context for you. For those who are not familiar with ICRA, it stands for the International Cultural Relations Research Alliance. We're a network of academics and practitioners from around the world, convened by IFA, the Institute for Auslandsbezirkungen from Germany, and the British Council. We're drawn together by a common interest in sharing knowledge and research and practice in international cultural relations. That is knowledge about the various engagements and interactions that occur between countries, communities, cultures, and peoples across the fields of culture, education, arts, civil society, heritage, and so on, outside of formal diplomatic channels or official state structures. We're also committed to making our network truly global, one that is inclusive and representative of expertise and perspectives from around the world, including the Global South. Hopefully that is something you see reflected in the program for this conference. On our website, you can find more information and videos from our previous conferences. So what we're aiming to do with this year's conference is to create a better understanding of how and why culture broadly understood needs to be at the heart of global efforts to build more peaceful, secure and inclusive societies, a key requirement for sustainable development. We're focusing in particular here on the UN Sustainable Development Goals and more specifically SDG 16. We're promoting and arguing for in effect a more holistic understanding of peace and security. One that acknowledges and embraces the role of culture in providing spaces for encounters, learning, social um, cohesion, as well as inclusive relationship building. Exactly the kind of social practices that are at the heart of sustainable group peaceful group formations. And we'll ask in particular, how and why international cooperation in this field can be supportive for these objectives. So this conference is about culture and it's also about international cultural relations. That is programs, projects, initiatives, and encounters that bring people of different backgrounds, uh, countries and communities together through and around culture. We want to understand how these relationships work in practice in different cultural and political contexts worldwide. And we are asking where and how this has the potential to foster the more holistic approach to peace and security that we think is needed. With Mondial Cult in mind, we hope to draw on all of this to provide actionable recommendations for UNESCO and its stakeholders that can help to re-energize delivery of SDG 16 over the coming years until the end of the decade which is the target date for the 2030 Agenda for, culture, for Sustainable Development. So that's the overarching scope for the conference. We've given ourselves a, an ambitious task, but we're glad to have you on board to help us work this through. On to today's session, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. We'll be hearing from five very different case studies, and um, we will have two hours for our session. So let me introduce each of the case studies in the order that they're gonna be presenting. Case study one will be presenting by Vassal Roshko, the coordinator of the Heritage Emergency Response Initiative in the Ukraine. He is a coordinator of that uh, response initiative, which he co-founded in 2022. 
Since 2016, he's also been the head of Tustan, uh, Tustan NGO, working on heritage tourism in the museum and touristic cluster Tustan, where he worked, among others, on digital projects using 3D fixation and modeling, AR and VR, GIS and databases, working with the Urich Borko Village Eco Museum and on preserving heritage for sustainable development. From 2014 to 2016, he was head of the Department of Museums at the Ministry of Culture of Ukraine, where he was responsible for crisis emergency response management for museums, inven inventory of museums and collections in the Ukraine, networking communication within the region, as well as starting a systemic and strategic work for the museum sphere. Before that, he had been director of the Tustan State Historical and Cultural Reserve from 2005 to 2014, engaging in documentation procedures for heritage properties and the protection, technical monitoring and conservation programs for cliffs, and the graf graphical reconstruction of the medieval log cliffside fortress of Tustan, visiting and guiding services, organizing the Ukrainian medieval cultural festival, Tustan, as well as community projects. He has a master's of architecture with a speciality architecture of buildings and structures from Lviv Polytechnic National University, wrote his PhD thesis on methods of research and graphic reconstruction of log cliffside architecture. And he's currently pursuing a key executive MBA from Lviv Business School. Um, and we are very happy to welcome you to our session. Next, we will have a case study um, uh, by Nicholas Kular. Uh, the director of Historias in K K K Kilometros from Colombia. He's uh, from Bogota, Colombia, and produced fiction and documentary productions in Guatemala, Haiti, Kenya, Rwanda, Indonesia, Mexico, and the USA. Always engaging local filmmakers to encourage the creation of community films in each country. He'll be speaking about a project which in English says, who tells the story, a filmmaking laboratory to understand community representation. Now he lives in Bogota, Colombia, where he founded this audiovisual training laboratory for teaching communities across the country to tell, tell their own stories through film called Stories in Kilometers. His work in the last five years, both fiction and documentary, has included the teams that graduated from his laboratory. So we welcome you very much to this conference, Nicolas. Our third case study, we will hear from Dr. Mir Nirmala Casey, President Pro Public, who will be speaking about theater, a thread binding heart to heart. Dr. Nirmala Casey has more than two decades experience in the development sector, having worked with several development organizations like Pro Public, UNDP, South Asia Partnership, USAID, etc. As a researcher and gender activist, she is an active proponent of proactive and holistic development among individuals, women, and children focused on physical, mental, emotional, and social well being. She was involved in research in the areas of NGO governance, gender, bonded labor, microfinance, cooperative, and alternative energy. Through research and advocacy, she aims to contribute to strengthen NGO governance and maintaining social justice. Working with these organizations and many other multilateral and bilateral organizations, in many different capacities. She's also a visiting faculty member at the Department of Public Administration, Tribhuvan University, um, Kirtipu, Nepal. She has done doctoral work on NGO accountability and has also studied at the University of Bergen in Norway. Welcome very much to this conference and our session, Nirmala. Thank you very much. Our, our fourth case study is, will be um, offered by Garda Rifai the co-founder of Mobadarun, I hope I've said that right, from Syria. And she'll be talking about a citizen's charter. Gada Rifai is an architect from Aleppo, Syria, holding a diploma in project management and urban planning, and is now working on a master's in post-war reconstruction. She co-founded her first initiative on active citizen and peace building in 2009, which developed into a network of more than 4,000 activists called Mobadarun, Initiative Takers, is as it's translated. Then she started her journey in establishing and supporting several organizations working on peace building in, for Syria and disseminating the values and principles of the active citizen. In 2014, she was awarded the Livia Foundation Award for her extensive work promoting peace in times of conflict. 
She'd been working in urban development since 2001. She participated in the rehabilitation project of the old city of Aleppo, where she was head of the planning section. She had a vital role in activating Aleppo's urban observatory while she led its directorate within Aleppo City Council. She also established the Aleppo A Child-Friendly City initiative as part of the development strategy of Aleppo. In parallel with her work on urban development, she volunteered with many local NGOs and helped establish several of these since 97. She worked in rural development where her ability to work with various social groups and encourage them to work together and participate in community development was vital in achieving successful outcomes. She firmly believes in cooperation between NGOs and the private and public sector. Her, wo her work was one of the first to introduce the concept of NGO-led urban development in Syria. So a big warm welcome to you, Gada, and you are most welcome here. Our final case study will be presented by Hala Salih Mohammed Noor, uh, the regional team leader for enabling university peace education, EUPE, um, in regional post-conflict and conflict settings as well together with Lynn Hesloff, the senior ad, uh, technical advisor on this project, enabling university peace education. Dr. Hala Noor is an associate professor at the University of Khartoum. She has more than 25 ex years of experience in university teaching and has a long experience in building education administrative systems and school systems. In the last 10 years, she worked as an education consultant in several funded by the EU, UNICEF, and the British Council. Currently, she's regional team leader for the Enabling University Peace Education Project. You're very welcome here today, Hala. Lynn Heslop, who'll be joining Hala, is the senior technical, technical advisor on the project, Enabling University Peace Education. She has more than 30 years experience in education program design, higher education policy development, and research. She has held senior education roles for the British Council, including Regional Director of Education for Central and South Asia, Senior Education Advisor in India, and Director Education in Myanmar. Her doctoral and research interests focus on the role of universities in peace building and social justice in conflict affected set settings. Also very welcome here, Lynn. So before I give you all the floor, and you'll, you'll, know, you'll have heard from the bios, we are perfectly uh, served by these wonderful uh, case studies that we're going to hear from. Let me explain the purpose and technicalities of the session. Firstly, is to provide case studies of international cultural relations programs and projects centered on peace and security in practice from a range of sectors, from education to theater to cinema. The session will examine their contributions to SDG 16 in different global contexts and ask, answer questions relating to how international cultural relations might be employed to engage young people in conflict affected settings in tackling structural society and ethnic conflicts in raising international awareness or in building trust and understanding in communities. As I said earlier, the session will run for two hours with 15 minute presentations by each of our case studies um, followed by audience Q&A. Given that we'll hear from our participants first, I'd really like to encourage you all to be posting questions or comments in the chat box as we move through the case studies. So by the time we come to the Q&A, we should have a rich uh, list of questions and comments from the floor. Finally, please note the session is being recorded and recordings will be made available on the IFA website and the YouTube channel afterwards. So, without any further ado, can I please invite our first case study by Vasil Roshko from, the, from Ukraine to present his case study. Welcome, Vasil. Hello. Hello. All good, we can hear you. Do you see my screen? We can see your screen as well. So I'll present Heritage Emergency Response Initiative from Ukraine. And in previous life before the war, I uh, took care of site museum, archaeological site, 
museums, festivals, 3D reconstructions. And I wanted to tell you uh, our responses of, uh, to, to challenges in Ukraine, uh, cultural responses. So eight years ago during Maidan uh, Dignity Revolution, we created Maidan Museum to, uh, to remember what happened and how society changed and uh, to preserve these values and this new state of society. Uh, so muse Maidan Museum appeared eight years ago. And other response was to try to change our heritage system. For two years, I worked in the Ministry of Culture and we had a post-Soviet remains of post-Soviet culture system, administrative and totalitarian. And we tried to uh, put everything together and to do some changes and to understand what we have during our independence after Soviet Union. Now we have the war, the war of Russia against Ukraine and Heritage Emergency Response Initiative is our answer on this. It's a, a volunteer initiative of different museums organizations, Tustan Maidan Museums and others. And our goal is to preserve heritage, but we have different tasks uh, for emergence, emer emergency response firstly, but later also for uh, renovation after the war. Uh, we started with mapping uh, damaged objects uh, um, in different uh, regions of Ukraine. But then we uh, began to do many, many other things like helping people, uh, evacuation of uh, museum artifacts, um, helping with materials. Um, another, our initiative was uh, documenting damaged heritage. Here you see uh, Borodyanka, famous Bordyanka's shell with the rooster. And uh, this case was the beginning of our complex expeditions to damaged objects. We understood that uh, uh, this territory was already deliberated, but we understood, it, understood that uh, this will not last. Uh, shelf uh, will fall quick, quickly. So we decided to take it to museum, but before we should do very good uh, documenting of this site. So we uh, used drones to do uh, aerial photography and with the help of photogrammetry, we uh, did 3D models. Uh, this expeditions, expedition was also um, to take uh, artifacts for future museums to um, record some oral stories but the main thing is that it was the beginning of the complex uh, expeditions to damaged objects. Then were Vyazivka charge, Kharkiv objects. And uh, here is one of uh, 3D models uh, of Lukashivka charge in Chernihiv region. So firstly, it's to document for further uh, renovation uh, of actual objects, but also uh, we, we used iChrome methodology for damage assessment on site. But for example, in Kharkiv region, um, we firstly we started to work with local team uh, mostly, and also it was uh, the beginning of um, working with uh, security service to start criminal proceedings against uh, Russia, uh, which destroy Ukrainian culture 
on purpose. Also, we think about further uh, steps. Uh, winter is coming, so we should do something urgent to preserve the most destroyed objects, uh, not only documented. But you know that some people get post-traumatic disorder, but it's also a possibility for growth. So that's why for us, uh, a big goal is to change heritage management system in Ukraine, which is post-Soviet for now, but we should change this and find a new role of culture and of heritage in society. That's why we uh, seek decisions, not only partial, but for example, with UNESCO, we initiated project of uh, infrastructure, data infrastructure for Ukrainian heritage, uh, like Europeana or Parare, to do system systemic solutions for this. And that's why we built our capacity, organi organizational, um, institutional capacity to uh, work in different directions like resource assistance or some rescue uh, responses or, but also for for future after the war transformation who are we at war with ussr built a totalitarian was a totalitarian state and its aim was to close cultural heritage from us, from our children and to dictate culture and, and history. We should understand this. That's why it's very important to open heritage for society from storages. And you should, you should know that uh, we are at the war with barbarians, which want to destroy us as, as Ukrainians. It's an example of their dress. That's why for us it's a war, a fight for, we think, for European values, not only for territory, and in this war, uh, culture is very important and culture create a new symbols. For example, this rooster from Borodian Kashal became a symbol of resilience, not only for us. And when we take care of heritage and think about future, about resilient museums, about sustainable business model, work with community partnership. We think about uh, followers, about not only visitors today, but those who will come after us. So if our mission is followers, then are we able to protect our future our identity and culture? This is a question to the world. Here is our detailed report about all directions of our work of Harry. And thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Vasil, for that very um... A comprehensive and inspiring discussion about the role of heritage in culture um, and it reminds me very deeply about the work that had to be done uh, in the post-apartheid era to not only restore the dignity and heritage of the people that had been disenfranchised by the apartheid system but also create new memories and new ways of thinking about how the importance of people's stories and everyday lives during the apartheid struggle. So this is very inspiring. I, th I think the symbol of resilience from the rooster 
the um, the image of the graphic of that shell of um, Borodjanka is very powerful. Um, the animation that you gave us that helps us really think about what happens when you completely destroy heritage, when it went to nothing and then came back again and opened it up. So I'm going to move straight along to case study number two. Um, in the meantime, can I please also encourage people to be putting comments in the text. Um, I'm going to invite Nicolas Kula uh, from Colombia to present his project. Thank you very much. And it's uh, such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Everybody hears me okay? Perfect. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to tell you a bit about <clears throat> our uh, laboratory, our, our filmmaking laboratory. It's called Stories in Kilometers, or HEC, which is the a reference for its name in Spanish, Historias en Kilometros. So I'll be referring to it as, as HEC. And it's an audiovisual training laboratory that seeks to form filmmakers committed to the development of their community, tapping into the transformative power of cinema as a tool for communities to represent themselves in their own terms. And this goal, however, can be very easily eroded into a series of short lasting experiences that disappear in a reality of struggles. This is very easy for it to happen. So the possibility of bridging the giant gap between having one single filmmaking experience in a community's life or having a life as community filmmakers is what drives us as a, as a laboratory. So let me tell you a bit about HEC's methodology. This was born and still is a conversation. It consists of a series of virtual roundtable sessions where professional filmmakers from around the world discuss with local teams over the course of a year what it means to have community cinema in their territory and where they jointly develop the necessary tools to make it happen. So the virtual component of our methodology has its, its challenges. We are not there to help them grab the mic or hold the camera or do the interview, but we are also not there to make the shots ours, to ask the questions we think are more relevant, to guide the film according to our standards. We are here, all the trainers from around the world in the distance, listening to them, the local filmmakers, understanding their struggles and learning from their own experience. And we are here virtually and constantly accompanying each local team throughout their day-to-day -day lives and learning with them what it means to articulate filmmaking with their own reality. So thanks to HEC's virtual training methodology, we are witnessing the birth of truly independent filmmakers. And with them, we are seeing the birth of original cinema, supporting what is becoming sustainable social filmmaking. That's that's what we've been uh, doing for the past couple of years. I'd love to uh, also share the screen, but I am not as, as savvy. <laughs> Let me see if we can do this very quickly. There you go. Yes, no, I'm savvy enough. This, in order to put you all in context, I wanted to show you, show you this is Colombia's uh, map. And the sustainable production companies that we're talking about are all over this, uh, all over these regions. And so, as, I've, so as, I'm, uh, as I tell you about our case study, I'm going to be showing you what the, uh, where, where, we, where we've been. So the first stories, we're talking about the first couple of, the, you know, it's starting in 2019. We started in different places. Here you can see the places where we've been. And with these stories, he captured the attention of our greatest ally to date with this the Commission for the Clarification of Truth, Coexistence, and Non-Repetition. The Truth Commission's objective here in Colombia is the clarification of patterns and explanatory causes of the internal armed conflict and the creation of a transformative environment that allows the construction of the broadest culture of respect and tolerance in democracy. Now, this is an objective that resonates with Heck's own mission, with our own mission, in its commitment to embolden local voices to speak their own truth. So HEC formed an alliance with Columbia's Truth Commission to assist in the creation of a collective imaginary of transition through quality audiovisual products as a contribution to national reconciliation. This map that I'm showing you right now is part of that commitment. HEC puts its methodology at the service of the Truth Commission's objective and the results have been groundbreaking with over 100 professional allies around the world ready to connect with local teams that are constantly creating better and more relevant films. HEC is witnessing the birth of national network of community filmmakers. And we, the, the HEC family, 
I've seen Afro-Colombian storytellers from the Pacific find their own narrative, like these ones that I had shown you, and teach us how to turn into both documentary and fiction storylines. We have seen indigenous people from Florencia Caquetá. This is a group of indigenous filmmakers. Uh, and they show us their ancestral stories to the world in their own language, Coreguaje, and following their own narrative rules. And we have followed young urban rappers as they become storytellers of a reality only they can tell. This was in Ibagué. Through film, that's the idea, like especially through each of them through film, but essentially all of them together embody a newfound notion of self-representation and a communal fight for the non-repetition of violence. They have become ambassadors of the Truth Commission's legacy. So this amazing experience that we've had over the past uh, three years has raised the question that is now guiding our future as a laboratory. Can our methodology give the tools for local filmmakers to tackle their community's structural societal conflicts? And it's not an easy question to answer because filmmaking can be easily, can easily be seen as an, as an escape rather than a confrontation of our realities, especially by people who are struggling with very real problems. We have heard the phrase, put down the camera and grab the shovel. We actually heard it here in Tierra Grata Cesar. It's a newfound a community that was born out of the peace process in Colombia, a, you know, a community of ex-combatants. And they were referring to a group of community filmmakers, these guys, a, from their own community who wanted to tell the story of this newly founded town where we seek, you know, where before the location, this, this was the location where the FARC guerrillas laid down their weapons. And when heck, we started to train their, these filmmakers, learning with them about the type of narrative this new community needed. After one year of work, we brought a giant screen to the community and in front of the entire town presented their audiovisual creations. This was a life-changing experience for us because the heck, because we witnessed the town's reaction to seeing themselves on screen to hear their own voices explain who they are, what they want to be, and how they want the story to be told. These short films became their banner to show the world what it means to create this community and to show them how fragile it can be if we don't understand it. After that event, the town understood the power that camera has while filming the shovel and how they are both essential to building their life. So Hex methodology has become, thanks to the communities who have used it and transformed it, a way to create a narrative of self-representation that is presented foremost to the community itself to empower it. And this is an enormous responsibility that we, the Heck family, have begun to undertake with care. Part of this care is to understand the importance of creating solid bonds of trust and respect that begins with horizontal conversations that go beyond filmmaking and grasp how we all, both trainers and trainees, feel during each part of the training. What makes us uncomfortable? What creates insecurities? What makes us feel vulnerable? What triggers historic marginalizations? All of this can happen during a seemingly innocent roundtable conversation about filmmaking. And we must always be ready to address it, learn about the possible harm our actions can create. To communicate all of this, has, has created a protection policy that is ceremoniously signed uh, by both trainers and trainees. And sadly right now, it's only in Spanish, but very soon it'll be translated into English. But with it, with this protection policy, we encourage everyone working with HEC to see the teaching of filmmaking as a path to understanding how to engage with communities from all around the country in a truly horizontal manner and to learn from them how they want to change their realities. A, a visual representation of how you know, we actually do it is through this, uh, the, you know, the, the way that we create our categories, which is called, you know, in, 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 let me translate very quickly, we have categories of different aspects of how different uh, communities have wanted to be represented. For example, histories with a gender focus, direct recognition of uh, the indigenous culture, recognition of the uh, Afro-Colombian culture, uh, proposals of new generations for change, or the importance of not uh, bringing back old, uh, hateful, old, old hatefulness, which is something very or old uh, hates, which is something very common in, in Colombia. So, now that we have these new formed teams and uh, a new alliance that we have with several European embassies in Colombia, we have been able to create this notion of horizontal conversations to take on a deeper meaning, which is the possibility to bring European filmmakers to have on-site workshops with the local teams to learn what it means to make films in each community, how to engage both the local community and the international audience with a single stroke. 
So thanks to these alliances, this is like the second stage, and there's you no know, multicultural encounters, we are witnessing the birth of an international network of community filmmakers that are supporting each other to become sustainable local production companies. This is what uh, the unique 2022 workshop that we're doing right now, actually, we're in the middle of it, where European filmmakers are engaging in horizontal discussions with local teams in order to make their films a true representation of their social realities. And this particular project capitalizes what we have been discussing so far, an international group of artists tackling a community's conflicts through their shared experiences with a common tool, community filming. So these local production companies, they've been, this is one of the most, you know, what we hopefully, what we hoped for was that they had been, you know, to be awarded with uh, prestigious filmmaking recognitions. And we've been able to do so in different uh, uh, festivals or in, over the past years. And they have been invited to participate in conversations about art as a tool for social change all over the world. And we are so proud of these results at HEC that we are now creating the first community filmmaking festival to be hosted in a community born out of Colombia's peace process, which is again, Tierra Gran. So HEC's challenge in the near future will be to bring its methodology to other places around the world to create lasting bonds between countries with similar social challenges and strengthen the network of international filmmakers. In 2023, we hope to do it both in Mexico and in Bangladesh. To do so, we are hoping to build alliances with everyone, well, to be with everyone here <laughs> at this conference. So whoever is interested in having film be a part of change and you know, make something that can really make their communities self-represent, something that can make them actually understand how they want to be seen by the world, well, you're more than welcome to start a conversation with us. And we want to find together the voices that have never before been heard in audiovisual form, the ones that never thought that could be heard this way. And we have now a new awareness of the existence of these voices. And all we need to do is to listen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nicolas. What an inspiring presentation around um, really the idea of fair collaboration in international cultural co um, cooperation. Um, you know, I love the idea of accompanying the team, the, just the, the idea of accompaniment rather than partnering or collaboration or funding, you know. Uh, and yes, a narrative of self-representation, community uh, film festival, what, what, a, what a wonderful future you, um, you painted for us. Thank you very much for that presentation. I want to move on to uh, case study number three. Nirmala Casey, you are you have the floor to speak about pro public in from Nepal. Okay, uh, thank you, Ebla, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, world friends, and I'm very much delighted to have in this August gather. Thank you, Sandra, connecting me this uh, beautiful uh, uh, gathering. Yes, uh, today we are having a big festival in Nepal, Dosai, uh, once in a year, if we celebrate the defeat of violence and injustice. So uh, from uh, this big festival, I, I would like to uh, share this uh, global film, big greetings, let's make a together better and happy world. So this is Nirmala from Nepal. Um, uh, currently, after 30 years, I have been uh, chairperson of, uh, female chairperson of this organization. Since three decades, we have been doing different activities from this uh, non-governmental organization, particularly focus on uh, governance, uh, climate change, uh, women's issues, uh, uh, and cooperatives, uh, different and public litigacy. And among them, um, the, uh, the peace, peace is one of, one of peace building is one of the big, uh, big, uh, big, our sector. So I'm going to, uh, next slide please, I'm going to share here about uh, the, how we um, mm, do peace activities in our context through this theater. Um, so after, you know, uh, accumulation of the diverse activities of ProPublic, next slide please, ProPublic, um, uh, ProPublic, we have been doing different research in the communities uh, after peace settlement of government still there is a dispute between ex-combatant and peoples. So we, we, we organize co uh, community-based integrated ex-combatant uh, research during uh, 
uh, that after that period, and we uh, we found that uh, high level of mistrust and fear between uh, ex-combatant and other community people. So bridge the gap between uh, between these two. We uh, mitigate fear and increase the level of trust among the among these groups. We organize these uh, dialogues, facilitation, and mediation uh, project. So uh, first phase, this project payback catered from uh, um, 15 to 17 implemented with uh, support from IFA. And then uh, currently this tool is being applied for social change for promoting gender equality, uh, minority rights, freedom of speech, transparency, accountability. It in, includes all the cases, ethnics, religion, gender, people from uh, diverse geographical region settled down in different settlement in Nepal. Uh, next slide, please. The major approach uh, considered by the, uh, this chapter is sharing the life, uh, life based stories from ex combatant victims, affected community, people, government employees, such as police, army from the conflict area, and enacting them by the trained dialogue facilitator as a, a citizen actors. After performing this uh, artist based upon the stories, uh, consented people, audience were found having a self-reliance that problems faced by them have similar nature, having uh, empathetically sensitive to each other's, uh, develop open communication, having respect, love, compassion, these things happen. Next slide, please. <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, and then, uh, 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 then uh, uh, now after that the uh, cooperation between uh, between the ex-combatant affected areas general people slowly the fear and you know trust fear is reducing and trust increasing next slide please <coughs> The, so some of the uh, before uh, before joining this um, seminar today, I, I was uh, last week I was in the field and we collected some of the reflection, uh, first hand reflection from the people who are you know uh, who are uh, who are uh, uh, benefited from this storytelling. A few I would like to share here is um, uh, people who share that I, I'm happy to get a chance to share my painful story from the past, I feel calm in the heart after sharing it, even though I shared it with my friend in the past, but it was not you know, perceived seriously. Now it is good to share among many people of my community because it, was, it is understood with, um, there are diverse language and um, highly challenged to share different, you know, uh, the uh, uh, activities, but from this uh, theater, uh, without uh, without language, this is a natural heart to heart connection. So people immediately after telling their story, immediately they act and they themselves feel, wow, there is my story. So they feel more um, comfort within sharing this story. Being a poor Dalit uh, of people, they cannot share, uh, they cannot hurt other. And after theater, they share, they heard their story. And people feel, oh, my story is also hard to other, so they feel I'm I'm good. Uh, I can also uh, uh, visible, you know, that sort of feelings. And then community people perform, feel good, happy with the intervention, engage also. Now I have a good network with the government and community people. They know uh, this makes us easier to do other professional activities because they that story themselves they are keeping and that is pain for them. While they share, they feel relief and they connected with the other groups and people think, oh, uh, this thing's happening and they have a, a similar kind of feelings uh, uh, with other people also. So a kind of uh, harmony uh, uh, st started. Next slide, please. And next one is, uh, you know, story start from into theater performance. I found an increased level of closeness with my community. Sharing of this story, this behavior was positive and harmonious. While sharing the story um, with the 
chatter with in front of the people people thinks uh, positive um, uh, you know respect uh, uh, with their pain and you know fears so now the, and less violence against the, uh, their fear and their activities on the ex combatant acts uh, asked me to join and observe the play back theater in community that time i was thinking that he might have me to take part in the mavis program it was only after i i i invited observe the theater i came to realize the reality of ex combatant during the performance uh, since hearing the story of ex combatant in the performance my perception toward ex combatant has been changed people before hearing their stories they they thought, they thought very much threat to the community after hearing all the all the stories from the ex combatant they thought they have similar kind of you know um, uh, beliefs and uh, behavior so this kind of uh, things happening in the field next slide please another uh, story is after our engagement in the project the community people felt comfortable to talk and share with us about community problems i feel that they have started to trust us the trust level is increased there has been increasing due to role and actor in collaboration with other local performance from backgrounds chautari natak has also supported to change our past identity and now they feel more comfortable with the communities before uh, they uh, they were very much threat to the community and uh, ex combatant were perceived differently in the community uh, before the threat, uh, that threaters now chautari natak have given a space for connecting with other community people and chance to change their perception toward us next slide please and we rarely receive invitation to there are many communities in in the in tarai and uh, different uh, cultures you know different um their uh, uh, languages so is other threat um, before now uh, from the from this theater uh, different communities together and they respect they hear each others and they support uh, their daily life you know so the community is uh, uh, bonding from this theater the many people of my community raise question how about my character date of my husband at the age of 15 a uh, sharing of the reality of my life community people share to treat me positively by saying i am selfless and courageous lady a very few could do as this as uh, time so you know after sharing i mean uh, the mostly the women while they became the widow they have a uh, many problems and they keep inside because that you know, her story she cannot uh, share uh, with the community uh, she doesn't have a confidence and that story not uh, listened now after sharing from the theater people themselves oh that sort of problem is having uh, you know um, uh, uh, the single women so that kind of uh, respect is increasing next slide please <clears throat> next slide please uh my husband sort of male uh, uh, mostly in uh, asian in nepal uh, um, the, the male male uh, male superiority attitude and um, patriarchy is you know the high level and women voice is less um, heard and they cannot uh, feel themselves as a human still this is some uh, uh, situation exist in some areas in nepal and after after uh, every day she has a problem with male counterpart and after uh, you know sharing this um, uh, story and in act and uh, through the uh, theater and her, her husband was participated in the, that program and now uh, she has a positive um, positive behavior with uh, family and collective decision started in the family and that kind of changes also happening it was very difficult to manage dowry for the marriage of her three daughters and her daughters had to face torture in the families earlier uh, she used to live with her youngest son but not now because she was mistress when she shared the story miss 
mistrust by her younger son in Chautari Natak performance. Her eldest son took her to uh, his house and how uh, now she is living with him. Uh, so she has also uh, 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 harmonious, uh, now she has started harmonious relation uh, from son. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, my husband would beat me every night starting home under alcoholic influence. I went eat for long. And after I share my story in the performance organized in my village, it has miraculous effect on me. I don't know what went through his head, but he stopped drinking alcohol and stopped beating me. Now he is highly supportive of me, extended helping and in household uh, chores. So that means uh, while performing, um, you know, the alcoholing, uh, alcoholing uh, in the theater, and he himself realized, oh, this is uh, bad. You know, so he changes, he, she told that. I have kept my story to myself until sharing it in program, then community people knew about my pain and I feel like I am a bit relieved. Now, while sharing this, uh, while she got the separate space and she able to share her pain, now she feel relieved and she feel more comfortable and she come out from the uh, home. The next slide, please. So now these two, uh, two slides, uh, we, we invited this uh, local representative political leaders, uh, uh, political leaders and government people, they highly recognize this theater and they feel it's a good, um, uh, good platform to, to, to bring together in different uh, parties, you know, uh, who treat each other, mistrust each other, so highly uh, uh, recognized from local government. And now uh, they think, okay, we have to we have to use this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, program in in making peace building. So they they acknowledge and respect uh, this product. Thank you. Next slide, please. So from all these uh, case studies, from all these sharings, part time sharings, from the people storytellers, real storytellers, what we found in our community now is increase the empathy, each other's respect and confidence among all the community people, discriminatory uh, exclusion issues such as women's issues are heard and addressed. Uh, incidents of violence activities reduce sustainably, uh, uh, coordination and collective action increase in the society, increase trust among and between ex-combatant and the community people, voice of women, Dalit, marginalized people increase and their active participation in different activities increase. Uh, formation and management of local social organization to uh, enacting dialogue and mediation center. This is a great achievement of our program because after uh, seven years, we, ha we have been uh, doing this uh, uh, forum in different places and now, uh, all these different parties, you know, uh, uh, different from Maoist, ex-combatant, local people who threat each other, doesn't have a coalition each other. Now these people come together and set the social organization and they registered government also, they started and we provided institutional development training. A number, uh, number increase in a local level representative and some are elected in a local bodies. Those, uh, those people who are, uh, in the trauma, who are in the problem, who fight each other. After seven years, some some uh, uh, actors, you know, citizen acts, they became a local representative and really doing very good work. Some combatants started social entrepreneurship. You know, after um, some combatants, they went government, uh, government uh, military, and some are in the community and those people uh, who are in the community are uh, involving in these activities. Now they started social entrepreneurship with very, um, you know, uh, uh, very people centric, centric and, uh, and a quality, a small quality uh, service they provided to the community. Next slide, please. So in Nirmala, I don't want to rush you, but could you start wrapping up for us, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So uh, we we have done uh, we have done um, we uh, five seven hundred fifty three uh, uh, provinces we have and 
only we uh, we able to conduct this theater uh, 60 60 provinces so more uh, more way more way we have to go and this is very much um, tested tool and people want this tool and uh, changes for the community and they want uh, ownership uh, ownership taken by the community people youth people are very much uh, active in the dialogue creators uh, not only this peace smoking program but other issues just like a dowry that's violence against women you know development issues corruption uh, and uh, lo locally rooted program for that uh, education also we use these tools and very very um, effective so now uh, we we found that we tested and we now we have to implement it uh, need to implement more other areas and uh, whom we uh, many places we share with the try to share the local government and they they highly appreciate it and they want to um, you know, pa uh, partnership with this local uh, uh, theater organizations thank you very much and it is very much um, impressive tool thank you thank you so much nirmala what a what a wonderful story about the role of culture and theater in particular in creating this deeper understanding in the community and allowing people's voices to be heard it's you know reminded me of what we just heard from um, nicholas that when people are heard they feel so empowered and actually lives can change i mean that outcome you mentioned about violence being reduced uh, really speaks volumes about the role that culture can play in helping uh, and a deeper understanding and um, and towards greater trust between people within a community. And I particularly liked what you mentioned about how you took it away from the very local community as well and involved the local government. I mean, I think there's something there to explore in the discussion. So thank you so much for that wonderful um, presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you. And with that, I'm gonna move now to our fourth case study, Gada Rifai um, from Syria. The floor is yours. Yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for the introduction and for the amazing case study that we heard before. And I was really all the time listening to all the great and amazing stories and asking myself, like we found ourselves in the middle of war, middle of conflict, and all by sudden we started to react as normal people, like that's normal reaction towards what we are doing. And all by sudden we found ourselves called heroes, change makers, and so many things and we've been awarded for things that we thought like it's normal to do and then i want to share my story <laughs> i want to share how how things really started so once we started in syria we, felt, we found out like we need to do something so we started this peace building network um we syria all come together we started to work in between syrian differences to, trying to have those spaces for people to come together to talk to share and to exchange about what their dreams for syria so one of the points that I want to stop here is that we all the time are able to dream about future, good future. It's really hard to dream about the bad, <laughs> the bad future. So it's all about it's all the time about dreaming on what different country we can have, what type of uh, system we want to live in, uh, what's our role in order to do these changes. So we start doing this work and to, and it's all at local level in between us as Syria and inside Syria, outside Syria, wherever we are. And then we found out ourselves at a certain time, it was 2016, when someone tell us, ah, you have to participate at international level, you have to be part of this all system, you have to take the voices that you mentioned, uh, Avril, like we, we need to take all of those voices to other level to be here to be noticed to, to really influence what's happening there for your country. So we said yes. So we started to participate, but it was kind of ironic. We found out like, yes, they are welcoming our participation, but they are really confused with us. We are, they, they think like we have to, to be systemized, uh, very well uh, organized in order to respond to their requests and needs as international community that they accepted the local community to be participated and influence their process. So they felt confused, like with good intentions, they established different platform from us for us to participate, to share our views. But it was really ironic, like where we have to, where we are able to participate, but as a consultancy role, like in a way, like we, we consult 
what's the future that we want to have. It's really ironic. Like you feel like you don't have a say of your future. And they really confused with the various and diverse opinion for us as Syrian, where our reality really changing from day to day, people living inside, people living outside. Now it's 12 years of war. So people really changing, changing their opinion, changing what they are looking for, changing on how they think like the, the future should look like. So we found out like here is our role. Yes, we are now trying to enter into this international system, but it's not the way. So we found ourselves that we are doing what we think is normal, but it's still in other people's eyes considered like, oh, wow, it's something really amazing. I think it's amazing. Like we try to, um, we try to find out another channel that could feed the current process, but at the same time, it's representing us. So we start to develop what's so-called citizen charter. And, um, and it's out of the general norms. Like it's not a charter that's saying we Syria want that only thing. It's really a charter that trying to express the different and various point of view opinions of Syrian people. So it's, uh, it's based on the process more than one time document. So the idea of this charter comes out like, uh, once we participate on this platform, so there is a limited space for us to be, to be there. Um, so we thought like, I'm not representing people. How could I go there and say, that's what we want. So we said like, let's have some dialogue session where, C where Syrian people can come together and across region, which is very important because as part of the war and people who experience war, they know like people start to be more isolated and people <laughs> and the gap in between us became wider and wider and hate messages became much more than before. So we started to have those spaces where Syria are able to come together, uh, share their thoughts and concerns. So the process is about spaces. Those spaces include everyone and the opinion of everyone. So there is no need for consensus. The things that international community are asking all the time, asking for all the time. There's no need for consensus. We can be ourselves. And the process by itself will validate the result of this citizen charter because uh, we uh, we having like we had the first round where we had this dialogue session inside Syria and neighboring country and in Europe um, with a certain design question asking people their opinion. So the charter by itself, if I read it, it will consist of my opinion and other people's opinion. So my role as Syrian to ask for my right and other people's right. So it's changing the perspective instead of standing on two sides, like against each other. So we all standing at one side asking for all of us rights. So that is changing perspective and it really take a long time and discussion during the process and people at, the, at a certain time, they felt no, this charter not representing us. So we said, let's have another round and that's what happened. So we, as long as we having more rounds of those dialogue session, including more people. So the result will be validated and we'll be able to have more concrete needs <laughs> or, um, or future, yani more concrete uh, design for the future that we are as Syria asking for. So it's really about the process and it's really helped um, us as Syrian to uh, um, yeah, it create a space to start the dialogue between all of us as Syrian and could be used later on. So we are preparing ourselves for, uh, for any future discussion later on. And as well, this document could be used to advocate and uh, at international level and policymakers at local and national level. And as well, it's really helpful for anyone who's really looking to work for um, for peace building for Syria. Um, so this is the process in general. So what we are looking for now, we are continue. We consider it as a live document. It's never stop. Um, and people can decide what consists of. Like for example, the first one, it was consist of the vision. So that people were start thinking about vision and sending messages to each other across the region. And then um, we start to talk about the value and principles that will be uh, uh, manage or coordinate the, our relation between all of us, the people who are who are who are Syrian sharing the same uh, identity. So we start to talk about identity because it became really various and different, and we need to explore it more and more. And we talk about what Syrians mean, what's our role, because it's changing. Really, it's changing. It's not the same as it was 20, 12 years ago. 
and what's our role as civil society as well and we talked about peace building and the political process how it's going what's our role how we can influence it and what we need from it and for sure we, we talked about transitional justice but because there were a different priority of concern like from one geographic area to another we kept a space where we can have a certain focus for this topic that's really focused on on the priority of concern for some people in each area so uh this topic it's for now but in each dialogue session we're asking people do you feel like those are enough do you feel like we need to integrate other topics having this live document is very important and even once we decided to upload it online so we decided to put it without logos without anything because we wanted it to be accommodated and adapted by everyone but still we are in the process like i can say like till, till now it's not totally adapted from everyone so it's it's a process and we know we know like it would it might take few years really to for the people and for the systems like international and local and national level to to consider it as a tool that they can build on but it's an initiative that we think like we as syrian from different ages young people are able to participate and have a voice there without being pushed to have a one voice <laughs> because sometimes really one voice is never helping anyone and it's not showing that is a reality and might lead us to another level of conflict later on so uh that the citizens citizens uh, charters that we worked on and we're still working on and looking forward like to uh, to have real achievement later on to be used and adopted Thank you all. Thanks, thanks very much, um, Gada. I, I think that's so, you know, it reminds me of the keynote address we had yesterday from uh, Karima Banaun, the UN, the former UN Special Rapporteur on, on Cultural Rights. She mentioned that it's not enough to have the diversity of cultural expressions. It's important to have the diversity of the diversity of cultural expressions. And that's what you're talking about, the diversity of the diversity of voices in Syria all yeah. being heard at the same time and i also thought it was interesting and i hope it can be taken up in the conversation uh with 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 our participants today this idea of how of having to shape yourself into what the international environment is asking for you know wanting a single statement of of need or concern and you don't want to be pushed to have one voice you don't want to be pushed to have one uh set of uh, vision um, and what that what that dynamic is about and how that leaves you feeling in in your space of Syria. So thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you. Right. And I want to now invite our final case study, um, Hala Nur and Lynn Heslop to present on the Enabling Un uh, University Peace Education Initiative. Um, and you are most welcome. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, just give me one minute to share my screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hala Noor. I am um, the regional uh, team leader for uh, Enabling University Peace Education in conflict, but conflict setting. Uh, thank you for, so much for uh, presenting the amazing you, guest studies me, and um hello do you hear me your video yes. is off can you yes switch it on, yes please? yes ah oh, yes okay uh hi <laughs> can you see my slides Yes, we, we see your slides. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, thank you so much for for uh, sharing all of these amazing uh, projects, and definitely we will uh, learn from them. Um, as I said, um, we are running uh, the Enabling University Peace Project, which is um, a three-year uh, project uh, funded by the EU. Um, just give me one minute. I don't know why the slides is not moving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Enabling University Peace Education is um, um, a regional project that is running currently in Ethiopia and Sudan, and it is uh, funded jointly by the European Union and the British Council. Um, and uh, it works on a model of partnership. And uh, one of the key things that it links uh, UK university, EU universities with local universities in uh, peace education. Um, 
and um, in both countries, uh, we work with uh, different universities in conflict zones or emerging conflict zones. Um, and um, um, we have a number of uh, um, objectives and aims for the project um, that works towards uh, enabling peace in both countries through uh, higher education institutions. Uh, Lynn, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Hala. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, um, as, as uh, Hala just described, um, our project is, is on mainstreaming peace education in universities situated in conflict or in near, or ne in, near in conflict zones. So um, the overall objective of the project is to contribute to improve participation of young people, particularly women, in local, national and or regional peace building activities, because in spite of all the energy behind the sort of the promotion and acknowledgement of the role of youth in peace processes and in peace building, um, young people continue to be um, underrepresented um, and marginalized in the, in the processes at local level, but also at national and regional level. And this is the case in Ethiopia and Sudan. And there are many reasons for this, um, but one of the root causes is, is the lack of opportunities for young people to gain the skills, to gain the experience and understanding of peace and peace solutions, to understand causal nature of conflict and to be able to engage in peace building in a nonviolent way. Um, and so the project was sort of um, uh, situated within this sort of, um, um, this, this issue and trying to address some of these issues um, through the universities. Um, so the universities are tasked to building a future generation of university trained local peace builders through providing peace education, which is driven by context um, that, that addresses sort of local issues, um, but also is structured within a sort of a framework, both nationally, regionally, internationally as the university, um, to be able to sustain good peace education, to share knowledge and best practice, um, and also to contribute to the sort of global flow of knowledge in the, in the area of peace and the study of peace um, in a more sort of sustained and um, formal way. So Hala, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, a little bit on the background of this. I mean, as you can see, we've got five areas, five main areas of our project, but a very little bit about the background. Most uh, students in universities in Sudan and Ethiopia do not have access to high quality peace education. Peace education tends to be focused either at the school level or it tends to be focused at a very specialist level, usually master's level in some universities. Um, it's not mainstreamed. Um, it's often decontextualized, so it doesn't directly relate to local contexts and the social realities of young people in those contexts. It's often very theoretical uh, with limited experiential learning. Um, and so students who want to study peace education, who actually have access to it, don't really have the sort of... Um, the opportunity to gain um, real experience on the ground and to get and to um, improve their confidence levels um, to go on further in life and to be more engaged in peace building after they leave university. Um, so despite universities in Ethiopia and Sudan um, in conflict zones having quite often peace and conflict departments um, there's actually very little in most institutions, very little research happening on local peace um, and conflict. Um, and so that creates a barrier to producing very um, relevant and contextually driven peace education. Um, and it also, there's also difficulty in developing sort of the uh, relevant curriculum uh, within each situation. Um, also, the other important part of the context is that universities, particularly um, in conflict affected zones, suffer from isolation. And they suffer isolation not only from their own communities, but also from the international community. 
And this affects um, the sort of um, knowledge sharing, it affects academic sort of growth, it affects um, everything that the university does um, in this field. It limits, it, it limits contribution to global, global um, uh, knowledge production um, and doesn't allow them to address a sort of an imbalance of uh, the global flow of knowledge, which is often skewed towards um, northern universities. Um, and so this is a barrier. So what we're trying to do here is that um, the, we're trying to, to create a multi-dimensional engagement if you like, to help the universities to create spaces in the international and local contexts to develop peace education for undergraduates. And I'm talking about undergraduates across cross-disciplinary. So if you're studying for if you're an art student or a science student or studying medical sciences or engineering or whatever subject you're studying. Um, you want to be able to leave university, go back into your context, and as an individual, as a professional, um, and as a community member, to be able to have the knowledge and skills in peace building to be able to contribute at that level um, in those spheres of your life. Um, so here we have five interrelated areas um, that the, that the um, project um, engages with. The first one is the provision of peace education, um, which is contextually driven. And the other three, the other four areas um, support that one area. So they're looking at the sort of the causal sort of um, features and sustainability um, issues that are needed to produce um, sort of in long term good quality peace education. So the area number two is to support context-driven research um, by engaging with communities um, and civil society organizations and young people in those areas. Um, area three is to develop communities of practice um, supported by universities um, across um, many stakeholders and peace building actors in communities. And Hala will talk about that a little bit in a moment. Um, Result number four is to formally and informally um, connect um, research centers in universities in, in conflict zones with those across Africa so that knowledge sharing can happen um, and relationships can be built. And result area five is underpins those other areas by, by developing equitable international partnerships. Um, with universities, these are, these are specialist peace centers in the UK and the EU um, to work with um, those universities in conflict zones. Um, so that's the framework that the universe, that the project works under. Um, and Hala is going to talk about um, particularly um, the connections with communities, Hala. Yeah, so, um... Um, one of the key areas, uh, one of the key lessons we have learned very early in the project is that culture and, and, uh, and values of peace are very crucial for any uh, academia or research work to be really of value and impact on the peace, uh, uh, peaceful coexistence and, uh, you know, um, the building of peace processes. And um, this uh, key lesson we learned by traveling to the different states, visiting the different universities, and that uh, learning that um, these local societies um, will not accept outsiders and will not um, be, um, we cannot talk to them um, uh, through, through, through academia only, we have to talk to them through culture. And that there is also, um, uh, culture of peace. There is a lot of peace values in the local societies, but these have been um, tampered with, destroyed uh, through uh, political um, interventions, through uh, regional governments, and 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 um, a lot of um, uh, hindrance has been there. So one of the key things we work towards is to enable uh, these universities to. Um, present peace to local, um, you know, to the societies around them through using culture and uh, through uh, empowering cultural uh, activities in the, re in, in, in the, in, in where they are, so that we can, uh, through culture, we can, um, you know, uh, spread peace and build peace and 
and and uh, in order to be strong indeed. So um um I just um um I want to give you just very quick example. One of the key examples is that um we wanted to learn from regional uh, countries around us. So uh, able to um you know to take um these universities from Sudan and Ethiopia. Uh, to visit Rwanda. And one of the key things we learned from the Rwanda visit that culture is very important, that culture plays a very important role in, in, in enabling peace. So um, actually, this is one of the key learnings we came back with after that visit. Um, uh, we went, we visited museums, we, uh, we visited cultural uh, places, we attended cultural activities, and we have seen how culture can be an enabler of peace. It's not just academia that could be an enabler of peace, it's just also culture is very vital for that. This was one of the key uh, lessons we learned from that trip, and we also... Um, through that trip, we were able to bring in uh, the Sudanese uh, academia and the Supian academia in one neutral platforms. As, as most of you know, that there is tension between the two governments, there are territorial um, conflicts between the two governments. Um, I always have problems when I want to go to Addis uh, to access my visa. So there are certain uh, difficulties between the two countries. But um, by taking the two delegations to a neutral ground, we were, I think we were able to build trust. Uh, we started a lot of good dialogue between the universities, and now we are seeing a lot of MOUs, um, you know, growing of that uh, activity. Uh, we're hoping that soon we'll be able to sign some of the some MOUs between uh, Sudanese universities, Rwandan universities. University and universities. And that, uh, peace is not is not is not um, a term. Peace is a value, and um, we were able to see how uh, values for peace were integrated uh, in the Rwandan uh, life and and Rwandan education system, and how uh, peace values were mainstreamed in the Rwandan uh, um, education. Um, new is about how to move a project is uh, academia and research but also culture and 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 communities are very important um and this is one of the you know uh, going and reaching these local societies cannot only be done through culture so we started a number of activities one of the key activities we did is that uh through um result area four which was building communities of practice we talked with the universities and I'll, I, we have several examples but i'm going to talk about two examples uh one of the key examples we we worked with um we talked with universities about um uh, supporting them in uh, peace initiatives and peace activities they used to do at local level so um one of the key things was drama uh, dancing and singing and um, going to local communities and spreading the message of peace through local languages, uh, local dances. So we, we started supporting um, and financing um, some of uh, the activities at the university, for example, in Niala. Niala is um, in South Darfur. Uh, Darfur has been a very uh, hot uh, conflict zone for many years in Sudan. So we uh, supported what is known as Niala Cafe. Niala Cafe is um, an activity that is run by the Peace Center in Niala University. They go out, uh, they bring young people, they talk about peace, they dance, they sing, and then um, they cook food from different uh, ethnic groups and, and they eat and they share stories and um, they enable uh, university students to have a taste of the other uh, cultures and other ethnic groups that are in their uh, state. <clears throat> Also, we uh, supported the Peaceful Coexistence Initiative. This is an initiative run by Kordofan University. And that initiative, uh, they go outside uh, the university, they travel to remote areas in Kordofan, and they do activities of dancing, singing with the local communities, and they copy And a lot is a promote peace, uh, you know, um, uh, promoters of peace and 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 they reach these communities by talking to their language by reaching to them in in, in that cultural um 
uh, heritage they have. Um, and, and this is one of the key things that we have learned. Of course, the project is uh, still moving on um, and we're hoping that um, we'll be able to um, have more good examples of uh, what is a project is trying to do. Um, of course, um, we have been faced uh, with a lot of challenges, um, you know, uh, a military takeover in Sudan, a civil war in Ethiopia, but um, we have learned that the only way for us to move forward is to be very near to these local communities, treasure what they have, um, respect the culture they have, and work through these cultures to promote peace. Uh, Lynn? Sorry, Lynn, um, can I just ask you to please wrap up because we've done the 15 minutes and- Sure, we... yeah, sure, great, sure. Um, so just, um, so to try and crystallize um, some of the things that we've learned from the project so far, you know, three, ma three main learning points, um, I think um, will be enough <laughs> on this one. Um, the first one is that universities are very important institutions in peace building. They're often marginalized or ignored um, in conflict situations for all sorts of reasons. A lot of them are political um, because they have a very complex relationship with politics and society. However, they are in a very unique space and they can create new spaces, which gives them really important agency as conveners of people, communities, professional groups, bodies, formal and informal, of sharing new knowledge and creating new knowledge and understanding peace. So we need to support them in this role. Um, they're anchors in their communities, they're cultural, economic and developmental anchors, but it needs to be financed and budgeted. Um, otherwise, it's not possible. These links die out, um, but they can be revitalized. Um, something that, Hala, you said to me sort of um, um, earlier, the, the second point, when, when culture is protected um, and celebrated, um, communities are saying, well, peace is protected and celebrated. And I think culture is very central to the role that um, universities can play in peace. And then, then finally, there's a really very, very rich resource of local ideas, creativity and cultural approaches to peace and peace building. Um, but knowledge and experience um, that are shared more widely, regionally, internationally, can be very transformative too. I think that's it. <laughs> wow, wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you, for, again, another rich and inspiring uh, set of conversations. And as an educator myself, I'm incredibly inspired to, to just hear about how you positioning the role of higher education institutions in the role of peace building and you know your final comments on 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 your on your on your reflections on on how important they are as anchors um economic social cultural and how they are ne they need in in our context of the african continent they all need further funding to ensure that they do the work that is so important and vital that you're saying about building and creating knowledge that can be shared that is locally contextual and is relevant to the local communities. Um, reading theoretical studies from other spaces, yes, is useful, but never as useful as reading about Absolutely. yourself being reflected. So thank you so much, both of you, for a wonderful set of presentations. So now I'm gonna open it to the floor. I'm going to hold back on my comments and um, reflections on these really remarkable um, case studies that have been presented. I'm, I'm so delighted at, at, at just how, how appropriate they each one is in terms of answering the question around peace and security, the SDG 16, the role of international cultural relations. And I really want to invite you to put your hand up, ask some questions on the floor. We have a good half an hour to do that. So um, I have already questions in the chat box if you want me to start there, unless those of you in the chat box would like to rather raise your hand and ask your own question. I'm, I'm watching for hands up. Otherwise, could I invite Laurie Allison? You started with a question for Nirmala. So Laurie's question, unless I, she's about to come on, I'm asking our tech to help us unmute 
people, our tech support. Well, Laurie's question is, a uh, question for the wonderful Nirmala. Have you noticed a shift in the perception towards mental health after beginning to implement techniques for self-expression? Does this differ across gender identities, sexualities, faiths, or age groups? Oh, thank you for a nice question. Yes, in the beginning, uh, it was very difficult uh, to come out and to express themselves, each individual who are suffer, suffering and suffer from this conflict, Maoist government, local people, they are uh, mistrust each other, fear each other. And then from this, um, this theater uh, come into this theater, we have uh, done many um, uh, uh, strategy. Uh, first of all, counseling, uh, trauma counseling, you know, and each individual um, coaching and some sort of um, uh, sharings, you know, uh, uh, creating safe space, motivating them, sharing from our uh, individual story uh, to, to motivate and encourage them. So, and slowly uh, from our um, uh, count counselor, trauma counselor, other um, people who counseling them, so slowly they come out, they forget and they themselves, they feel, oh, these are the people, we are similar, you know, they forget their um, trauma and their psycho, you know, uh, and with some sort of um, uh, feel visit and exposure meetings, many uh, intervention we have done, so, uh, so, so that they come up and they, they respect each other, they reduce their fear. And of course, in terms of gender, caste, and other ethnicity, um, you know, uh, uh, in Nepal, still the younger uh, youth, women, they cannot share their feelings in front of their male, uh, male partners, uh, fathers, you know, patriarchy highly exists. And we have to, um, even in in the university uh, students, uh, they, they have to ask their parents where to move, where to go, uh, what to do, what not to do, you know, still many things is uh, depending in the uh, in the pa 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 parents. So that um, uh, with this theater, uh, uh, theater, they forget themselves. They are in the, uh, in the uh, drama. And so, so they don't care about who are there in the position people, you know, the age people, they, uh, they feel themselves, they are acting their story. So that, and, and the people who are listening, they also think they are the same similar space so that it is wonderful and it is work. work. Thank you, Nirmala. The next question, can I ask all our case study people, all our, all our wonderful presenters to just put your videos on so we can all be on the screen together. Um, the next question anybody could answer, in fact, it's from James Perkins from the British Council saying, you know, um, and by the way, there are many positive comments. I'm not going to read them all. I hope you're all reading them and feeling affirmed by the, res the response that your case studies have are, are being received with. Uh, he says, how can international cultural relations organizations like the British Council and others support these initiatives more effectively? So should I start? If you'd like, yes. Yeah. Yes, because we have invested almost all seven years to bring these people in the in the this professional stage. And this is this tool is successful experimented. And we tested only uh, 6% within Nepal. And so that uh, we have really, uh, 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 really rich professional local people, local youth, active actors, citizen actors, so that we uh, really want to uh, work together with British Council. Uh, some, uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Cook mentioned about the film, and today also one friend mentioned about the film. It's, uh, we hope it will impact more. And you know, uh, uh, more than the language, more than the theory class. Uh, so uh, because uh, from the theater, we we uh, this is accepted and accepted, and people love it and breaking easily breaking the silence. 
making come together in same place so that it is very effective and we want to spread this um, theater many other areas also uh, after peacemaking there is many other issues um, violence against women's dowry you know corruption uh, governance issues you know and even in the um, uh, political uh, how to be uh, ethics and integrity issue over there so we want to uh, partnership with uh, with um, british council yeah, unfortunately, the list is rather endless, isn't it, of all the social challenges that could be reflected through empathetre. And um, I completely get that international cultural relations can play a real role in not only making these things travel further in your own countries, but also sharing the lessons learned with, with others. Anyone else want to add their voice to what you think could be a more effective partnership from international cultural relations? Uh, I don't know if I'm, I may say something. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, actually, um, well, once I, I read the question, I felt like, yeah, it's, they already did, because we have a very good partnership, actually, let's say it in this way with the British Council. But if I want to say why we consider it as good, because we were very local, we are very local uh, initiatives that have been supported by British Council like 12 years ago. And we still, till now, uh, are able to build a real partnership with British Council. So they are, Yani, for me, what I found it very useful, they are valuing the experiences that we have as local people. And um, they considering, not just considering, we are a real partner in most of the project. Like the last pro initiative that I mentioned, it was in partnership with the British Council with no upper hand which was really important. Like we decide what we want and we have a space for discussion. We say what we like and what we don't like. And about the process, some of partners, they just want to have the result where uh, our work with people, it's a process work. It's not yeah. just about to reach something that uh, we'll celebrate together. So the process by itself is very important. So respecting this process and the low process is some, sometimes because people need to feel comfortable in order to interact. So respecting all of this time needed in order to have an achievement together, it's really important. And I think, um, as Yanni, I, I, I don't want to be look like I'm saying like, yeah, British Council is very good, but we have very long partnerships that have been started with being participants in one, in, in one of their programs till now we are real partners. So I think- It's going. always good, it's always <laughs> good to give same credit same. where it's due. Always good to give credit where it's due. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but keep, going, yeah, keep, keep doing it the same way. I found it really yeah. good partnership. So thank you. Great. Anyone else want to add any comment on, on you know, anything around how your projects could be more effectively supported by the inter by international cultural relations? As, as, it looks like we've lost Basil. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case. Um, yeah. Anyone else? No, no one else. Okay, then the next question was for Vasil. So that's why I was just checking if he was still here. So I'll move to um, another question from uh, Chan from uh, Turkey. Thank you very much for the great presentations. I have a question. Do you think that the knowledge gained from one project can be generalized and applied in another part of the world? In other words, to what extent can we create peace building patterns through arts and culture as a method? I think it's a really important question, given that all your projects are so vitally different, but they do have very particular values and principles in common. Who would like to? Nicolas, can I ask you to start? You nodding, nodding your head? Absolutely. <laughs> I think. I agree that that's a very important question because um, it was such an honor to hear all of these projects that are uh, here today. I was like blown away by what you people are doing. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us. And I think this uh, space is probably one of the first stages into creating intercultural relations that really become sustainable. But as, as both Gara and Yamala were saying, horizontal. I think that's the key. Both, I love what you were saying, Gara, about the the need for horizontal uh, relations in uh, you know as as financiers, as uh, um, as people who want to help. The most important thing, or people who want to be part of this process, the most important thing is to understand that we need to understand each other at the same level. And these conversations are, I think, the first stage 
of understanding how we can help each other. And the first thing is to know that we exist. And that's not a small step because I think that all of us are, you know, that we're working at a, we're working not just to, to create something uh, specific, but also to diffuse it for the world to know. So I think that this is, the, you know, to, to know that we exist and to start uh, communicating further is the first, is the first stage to so create a real of, lasting, long the lasting. Conversation, documentation, exactly. Anyone want to add anything to that? To that? Yes, please, Lynn. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I agree that sort of, you know, the, the range and the sort of the diversity of the projects that we've just heard about is really um, very inspiring. And um, I think one of the things that can really stimulate um, innovation, new ideas, etc., is, is, to, is to reach out internationally across cultures, across different sort of uh, um, countries, experiences and learning. And uh, but of course, that needs to, get, to come back through a lens of um, your own cultural reality and your own cultural sort of um, um, uh, appropriacy and things that are going to work. And I think people who are working locally and are part of those cultures and communities um, ca can do that. They can see ideas, sort of, you know, look at innovations and then really sort of reflect and critically assess, you know, um, what's, what's actually useful in their own context. But I think without that sort of that, um, uh, you know, opening those doors and those sort of networks and those and those sort of uh, connections um, across the world and across different cultures, um, I think we can get very, very much channeled in our own way of doing things. Um, and uh, there are things out there, I'm sure, that um, that are very successful in different countries um, as approaches, as models, um, as frameworks. Um, that can be very, very useful in different contexts. But I also wanted to say that, you know, in more formal contexts, in terms of um, relationships and um, partnerships, um, they can quite oftenly, often be skewed towards one partner or another, even though they start off as a very mutual um, sort of, uh, uh, mutual intentions and equal intentions, I think without consciously engaging with the sort of the, the equalities and the ethics involved in partnerships, that can be lost um, unintentionally many times. Um, and, and in, you know, in the projects that we have, for example, with international um, universities, um, the first thing that the universities are doing is setting up an equitable partnership framework. Um, that is before the collaboration through all sorts of things happen. And this, this addresses the horizontality that we need in those projects, despite differences in resources, um, you can still have um, equitable and ethical partnerships. And I think sometimes, you know, um, that needs to be, um, you know, uh, developed as part of the, um, the project itself. I mean, thanks, Lynn. I think that's such an important uh, uh, point about how in the conceptualization of the project itself, those values that you were speaking about need to be established right up front and that the co-creation of the project needs to be have all the equitable fairness issues written into it. And I think it segues very nicely into James's second question, which is which you can answer at the same time, anyone else who wants to take the floor about any key reflections from your experiences about what either what works or what does not work when it comes to making these partnerships uh, fair and effective. Oh, well, welcome, Basile. Uh, it's good to see you here. Thank you. Yes, sorry, I had problems. N no worries. Anyone want to pick on that question uh, just, just going from what Lynn was saying? about what some reflections from your own projects about things that didn't work and that you needed to address or attend to in order to ensure that they did work so we know no projects are simple they're not one they're not linear in one line or everything being fantastic and working well there's always challenges and what though some of those challenges were i think it would be really important to share with our audience i i yeah Hello. Uh, one of oh, yeah one of the key things that uh, when we started working with the project is that we said that 
we don't want this project to be a political project. We don't want, we want it to be an academic project. But uh, one of the challenges that kept facing us all the time was politics, you know. Um, we had uh, parliamentary elections in Ethiopia, changing of governments, new, new ministers in place. We had a uh, civil war breaking in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, we have a military takeover in Sudan. Uh, until now, we have the revolution going on, demonstrations. I'm talking now, currently, there are demonstrations outside in the streets. Uh, Khartoum is, 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 is going through a uh, black out. There are strikes. We're facing a lot of challenges. But um, there is one essential thing that we learned, that we are here to empower young people and to empower women. And we cannot do this in a vacuum. Uh, we have to listen to the politics. We have to look at the culture. We have to uh, you know, em embrace everything and take it with us in our journey. Uh, we cannot say we are going to work in a vacuum. So this is one of the key things we have learned, uh, that we cannot um, build and enable universities uh, and empower young people in a vacuum. We have to uh, take all of these. So um, um, as Lynn knows, uh, we're doing a number of baseline surveys. We're doing a lot of reporting. We're doing a lot of research internally to inform us and to tell us the gaps we are seeing. Uh, we're also doing um, a gender um, uh, inclusive strategy to, you know, be to inform us from um, um, an academic view uh, how to integrate women and to empower women in both countries, and and what is the role of women in in higher education and in peace. So uh, we are learning a lot, and this is one of the key things and messages um, in working in projects in such conflict zones. You have to be listening all the time and you have to have that dialogue going on internally as a team and even that with all your stakeholders you have to listen to them and you have to keep listening to what is happening and to have to be agile to be able to adapt to the different situations thank you thanks Hala. i mean uh, uh, anybody else want to add to that or should i move to the next question now i, I missed the question to vasil so i want to come back to that um it was asked um uh, earlier on let me just see uh i have to find it now sorry um sorry and i can't see it i can uh, tell my reflection also uh, okay on thank you works and what's not while uh, you are um, looking for yeah. the question so uh, for us uh, great challenge is our capacity to act Firstly, you know, culture and heritage is about safety and no, no one place in Ukraine is safe for now. And you, uh, for example, in Harry, we try to work uh, to find some resources to help other people. But at the same time, we understand that we are under fire, uh, uh, museum workers are under fire and, you know, it's some some kind of um, psychological lack of resources and uh, so on another thing is that there are much more um, m many options uh, of uh, international help but uh, we should be capable to take it and to organize ourselves uh, during the war and uh, in in national scale because there are many regions under fire and for example expeditions should be total resource help should be total and uh, it's uh, on the one uh, on the one hand uh, self-organization is a very strong part of uh, ukrainian society but on the other, uh, and it's very good uh, during the war because there are no centers that you, you can destroy and everything will end. But on the other hand, uh, there is lack of resources. Uh, resources are not uh, um, endless and you should coordinate. <laughs> and it's hard to coordinate because many sources from abroad, many initiatives in Ukraine, you know, and uh, at the same time, a low capacity of uh, central uh, ministries, for example, partly because of post-Soviet uh, system of management, uh, which doesn't work anymore. 
direct methods and old uh, ways. I think it's a problem also of changing the war. I think not only Ukraine was not ready, but the world was not ready to a Russian's war. Uh, but on the other side, uh, ministry, uh, no, war is what changes priorities and uh, warriors uh, don't have time for heritage protection and it's hard to protect heritage without military forces, you know. And that's why uh, what doesn't work, there are many people, there were many who came and told, tell us what to do, you know, and we have no time to tell 200 volunteers what to do. We need uh, leaders who can take a zone of responsibility and will manage other people and to, to have results. We, we have no capacity to, to sit everybody and tell you do this and you do this and tomorrow again and again, because we should do also by ourselves, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I think, I think I've, yeah, it goes to the question that was asked of you and I can't find it, but it was about whether you had an emergency response uh, program before the war? No. For millions. No. No, okay. systemic. So that's why it's a, uh, it's like um, we are building the spaceship during the flight, you know? Yeah. We yeah. fight, we yeah. are building the ship, and we we should go not the, this way that uh, uh, different. Uh, so we shouldn't continue all the path that uh, European countries do. We should, uh, and we go straight to the present point, you know, for example, it did digital infrastructure. So we, we shouldn't do all the mistakes or do the, the old path <laughs> with waves. Yeah. So it's the challenge and uh, the uh, look and the need for expertise is also very important, uh, not only uh, professional expertise, but also management uh, models, uh, financial models uh, to do this quickly in the state of war. Absolutely. And I think it reminds me of, you know, what was said during COVID is that we're all in the same storm, but some of us had big ships to keep us through and other people had raft, little life rafts and other people only had life jackets and other people had no life jackets at all. And so the whole experience of the storm is experienced differently. And I think everybody's creating their projects in a, in a, in a storm, but with different resources and different abilities to manage that. And that comes to the next question from um, Odila uh, Tribble from IFA. She asks, um, as you learned from the case in Nepal, that professional mediators and facilitators are helpful or even necessary for discussing the performances. What is the experience of the films in Colombia? Um, the reception can be ambivalent. Is there a methodology to assess post-conflict situation and the state of communities? So that's for Nicholas. Yes. Well, I think that the, the reception has, it was probably what surprised us the most and in creating these, uh, these, these films, because when we started our methodology, uh, our first, our, the first stage of our approach was we are going to uh, you know, give the tools for people who have never have access to, to filmmaking uh, for them to be able to tell their own stories through film. So that's what we want. We want to create production companies, local production companies that can be sustainable and can tell their own stories to be shown in international festivals, to be actually diffused so that the world can learn their stories. That was stage one. The moment we start diffusing in the communities, because what we do, our project, our methodology ends, our, our training program ends with a giant screen uh, in communities that never had giant screens. So we, 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 we invite the, the, the entire community to show the work that the production company has done. And this was, a, it started as a ceremonious closure and presentation of the, of the production company. And suddenly we realized this is the most important stage of our methodology because it shows the, the community what it means to be self-represented. That's where it, everything changed for us. This was over three years ago. We said, we're not just giving uh, people their tools to, 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 make, to make films, we are, sitting down, us as spectators, 
looking at what a community wants to tell about itself. That's that's what makes all the difference because then then we are the ones that are learning. We're not just given the tools, and you know, and that's that's a very hard element about a horizontality and verticality. It's very easy and very natural for most uh, professionals in general. They're like, oh, let me tell you how it works, right? And let me tell you what it's expected, and it's very profoundly uh, satisfying to be sitting down and realize that they are the ones telling us their narratives. So mm -hmm. I think that the presentation of a film is much, mu much more than just seeing uh, a movie. It's really a understand like a culture speaking to itself. Thanks, thanks very much for that for that response. I'm I'm sorry to cut you off, but we got literally three minutes and. Yes. What I want to ask is that if you, if we were to give a message to Mondecult, which is why we're having these meetings, right? If we were to give one message to Mondecult about how to make SDG 16 come alive, this peace and security, what would that message be coming from your experiences so far? What would that one message be? And I want everyone just to say one sentence or one word that just should be in a message that goes to Mondecult in their deliberations around the role of culture in our societies? Yes, uh, my message for them is thank you for uh, collecting this beautiful world, people who are doing really locally rooted and globally connected issues. So you are trying this beautiful world. And yes, for um, we heard about the sinking space of NGOs. But in our context, in, uh, we actually, we are doing really good work and let's uh, put hand together uh, with uh, uh, NGO and uh, uh, with university. I mean, the education institution, let's collaborate uh, um, for working future. Together. Thank you, Nirmala. Anyone next? I can go next. Yeah, the wait for word <laughs> to work on peace and security. That's my message. Say don't, it again. Don't wait for word to don't word wait. And security. Yeah, it, <laughs> we, we, yeah it's, it's, there's so many things we can do before. No need yeah. to wait for war. Absolutely, don't wait for war. That's brilliant. Thank you, Edgara. Next, <laughs> another message? My message is that culture needs fortresses and warriors against barbarians. Thank you. Yes, Nicholas. Um, my message would be, let's um, let's learn. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay. Um, no, my message would be, let's let's learn to listen. Yeah. Because there are voices from all over the world. Let's learn to listen. Thanks. It's so interesting how each person's message is very particular and very interesting because it comes straight out of your learnings. Hala and Lynn? Yeah, um, my key message is that culture is 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 a, is an opening door for uh, enabling peace in local communities. Thank you. Lynn, last, well, last think, word. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that says it, actually. I think that says it for our, for our project. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. And there are many other questions. I'm going to offer that we send those questions to those to all of you who've been participants. And if you'd like to answer any of those questions, we'd help mediate and, and make sure that people get responses, since they're really interesting questions. And everybody's been, you know, so thrilled with this set of conversations. And thank you all for your time. And thank you to the, our wonderful audience as well. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.